Well, Russell, I mean, thank you for coming up to, to Boca to, to do this podcast with us. I mean, Absolutely. We've been speaking about this for a while. I've known you for quite a while. Um, probably the greatest tarpon fisherman I know. I wouldn't say uh, that, but... Well, I mean... If I you, think you if, catch the most tarpon. Yeah, I'm just going to say here, there might be different people that, that do things differently. They catch a lot of fish. But your numbers, I don't know who else catches close to a thousand fish a year. What's the biggest number you've ever had in a year? Uh, over a thousand. Right, thousand fish. So you're hooking. What do you think your hookup ratio to catch ratio is? With bait, it's a little bit different than fly for sure. Not really. No? It's the size of the fish that's a difference, not the, the bait of the fly. Look, with a fly, unless you really wait and strip tight that fish tight. And you go, you see the bite, and people go to set the hook. It's very rare that they're going to catch very many fish. But with a bait, you got a bait in the water. You don't have those rods in their on your customers' hands. You have them on racks. Rodney catches all your fish. So when that fish eats that bait, that rod's going to get tight. You're going to, I think, you're going to catch more fish with the way you tarpon fish than we do on flies. Again, I think that it's the size of the fish. We're right, and I mean, I mean, if you're watching it eat, and it, you know, you've but got let's a, just say you we're just catching all big fish. But if you've got a, a a comfortable angler who's calm and isn't losing it, and watch the fish eat, and just full panic and freezes, and you know, jacks the fish and doesn't let go and breaks them off. I mean, it, it, if if you have a calm angler, then I think you know it doesn't matter. So but you think I think you it's think... the person's response when they've, you know, sat in Colorado and dreamed about this, and then it finally happens, and they just lose their marbles. Like, yeah, but but from what I understand, you have most of your guys having the rod in a holder. It depends on the clients. I mean, the fly guys don't, of course, and they, I yeah. catch a lot on fly, and I catch a lot on bait. But okay. I think what he's saying too is like the size of the fish. Like your That's hookup the ratio is going to be much bigger, better with a hundred pounder than a twenty pounder. For sure, right? those, those smaller big... fish they have no weight in their head, so when you go to set the hook, the whole head moves. That hook doesn't penetrate. The bigger the animal, it's like a dog with a string or a cat. When you come tight, you know he may quiver or do a little something, and then be like. What's going on here? When the little one closes his lips and he feels the movement, he's in the air. But and you don't get the angle. He's already up shaken and you're trying to come tight. If if you know, when when they go into panic mode before that you can even react. Right. No, there's a lot to it doesn't that. have the time to swim forward and, and make the turn and get the angle and try you know what I mean? When they panic so fast, it's like you lay a string on a dog and he lays you're like what? Right, especially when you're bait fishing with circle hooks, right? Because you need them to start swimming away to get that circle I hook mean, in the corner. It makes a big difference, and uh, the smaller the fish, the harder the hookup ratio. Whether you're when you jack them, you turn their head at you, or the head. Just, there's no resistance. The head moves sometimes, or sometimes it's just uh, the They're in fish the air. closes his lips, and he's already in the just ballistic mode and he's flopping through the air and he's just shaking and, and Falls off. it doesn't end well. Yeah. Well, let's go back to our initial conversation when we first sat down. I I asked you, well, one, you just had an operation. I hope you're feeling better. I mean, you're here. You're <laughs> Tell me tell me what happened to you. No, I was on a trip like, uh, I don't know, 10 days ago or something and I started having a stomach ache in the middle of the and I was like, man, I think I need to go use the restroom or something and had a guy and his wife on the boat from Brazil, and fishing was pretty good, but uh, the pain got worse and worse, and I was just kind of gritting it out, and I was like, man, I'm going to be a pussy. I'm not going to cut this trip short, and I started like sweating and getting nauseous, and the pain was getting so bad that it was like, all right, this is, this is maybe something a little more serious, and we were, the fishing was pretty good. We'd hooked 13 i think we caught i don't know six or seven or pretty something good. And, pretty good yeah and a snook and and i was like i'll give you guys a discount whatever it's three hours i'm done we're out of here and uh and then you know once they saw that i was just like and how much pain i was and they wanted to ride with me and i was like get off my boat now <laughs> and they were like arguing no we want to go with you and they wanted to you know make sure i was okay for the ride 
And I just, I didn't want the liability. I just got them off at the dock and hammered down and burned every no wake zone. And I had my buddy Ramiro waiting at the house and I pulled in and threw the rods down and went straight to the hospital and they uh, did like CAT scans and everything. And somehow my intestine had rolled and twisted and stopped circulation and was, uh, it was an issue. So they did emergency surgery on me. And uh, so I'm all stapled up. I think maybe tomorrow or the next day I'm going to go. I'm going to look and get the staples Just let your out. customers grab their faces. Uh, it's, it's you know, light tackle time of year. So. I did that with Bob Branham. I got him out of the hospital. Remember when he was really sick? I said, Bob, yeah. come on, you need some fresh air. We went tarpon fishing. And, and we were down by Government Cut where you fish a lot. And we could cut this really big fish. And right next to the boat, Bobby grabs the fish. And he starts thrashing and Bobby wouldn't let go. And he just gotten out of the hospital. He popped a hernia and he still has a bulge from, you know, from well, that. Well, that's what happened. Day. I had a hernia in my stomach and uh, it somehow the intestine was pushing back and forth. And it, uh, you know, it, it the intestine got rolled like a sausage and twisted off on the ends or something. I, I don't know, mm. but it hurt. That's all I can tell you. You're okay now, though. I mean, they stapled me up and I'm here, so. You're okay. Yeah, I um, got it. Yeah, before I, I don't want to cut you off, Nikki, but the other thing you made mention, I asked what kind of a boat you're fishing, and you're starting to talk about this new technology. I think your greatest asset has been you've always thought outside of the box. Most tarpon light tackle guys don't think like you, and if I'm not mistaken, you've taken a lot of the technology from the offshore guys to the inshore fishery. And you were just mentioning about this new electronic stuff you have. Yeah, it's, I always told mates and stuff that worked on the big boats with me, like no robots, that's my motto, no robots. We're not here to do what everybody else does every day and repeat the process. We're, you gotta analyze why things are being done and th see if that makes sense to you instead of just duplicating what everybody else does and then try to come up and figure out your own stuff. and. But the, but you're talking about guys like Ray Rozier, Bouncer Smith, these really legends, high, yeah. iconic legends. I find it difficult to ever even doubt how they were doing things. It, it's not that how they're doing things. It's that it's that the the how would I say it? Like the the layout in general. You know why why would you put your bobber above something or below it? Why would you put this this way or that way? Why would you? do stuff and that's the way it's always been done and if you try to analyze whatever kind of fishing you're doing and think if there's a way to do it better and uh i think that i i stay awake too much at night and i think way too much about fishing were you really smart in school no nah, i was fishing <laughs> <laughs> you're a smart fisherman i i mean in yeah. my high school like my senior year i was in the work program so they want, I actually had straight D's because I was putting in 45 hours a week at work. And they kept telling me that they're going to make me quit my job because they wanted me to stay, you know, stay in class and have better grades. And I told them either I'm going to quit school or you're not going to bother me at work. And I showed up every day and I went to school, but it wasn't. I was living on my own, paying my own bills in high school, you know, not renting a room from somebody and. And uh, I had bills to pay, and I was still fishing, but it wasn't. Uh, I wasn't a straight A student by any stretch of the imagination. Be I'm not that smart. Because you're you're brilliant on the water. Let's go back to that question I just asked. Tell me about the new electronic stuff that you have, and why do you have it? Oh, because I'm insane. Well, it's a new boat, first of all, right? No, new to me. Not it's a 1987. It's definitely not new. Intrepid. But it's new to you. Yeah. I bought it, and I have uh, spent a ridiculous amount of money being retarded on redoing things on it. And uh, it's got, uh, I think, a pretty impressive suit of electronics. So we'll see when it's all, everything's all firing together. But it's, according to Furuno, they said it was the most powerful transducers they've ever bought or try to you know ever bought from them to put into a uh into any center console in the world let alone a 28 footer but you what are you using this boat for i really like slow pitch jigging 
and uh, deep water fishing and light tackle sword fishing. So that's the application. Plus, with twin 200 Suzuki's, I can get two and a half miles a gallon if I go run a tarpon trip. I can go pop them out and put up the kites, catch them sails, and then come in at sunset and catch some tarpons. And I can still troll and motor it. I can still, it's not too big. You know, when you get too big, you lose that multifunction tool. You just become, you know, it's harder to do anything with. And the other boats is an egret. So yeah, you, my egret. You, so you think you'll fish them like 50 50? I don't know, we'll see. I mean, the egret's definitely the money maker, and hopefully that the uh, the other side will fill in. I don't think I'll ever get the money back out of this stupid boat, but you're gonna learn uh, a lot. It's got a hundred thousand dollar electronics package on it. Wow. Now look, uh, we've been pretty much fly fishermen. Yeah. Most of our guests are fly fishermen. A lot of our audience are fly fishermen. So at some point, we want to talk about how how can fly fishermen learn from you. What can we learn from a guy like you that catches a thousand fish a year bait fishing? Uh, the first thing I would tell you is, um, do you want to catch fish or do you want to look at fish? <laughs> I mean, just, if you want to look at fish, go sit in the ocean and sit there staked out and throw against the wind and try to balance yourself on a <laughs> Okay, and so if you want to catch fish, you're going to fish at night with a sinking line at Bahia Honda and, nope, and nope, swing nope. fish, or how are you going to catch all these fish? Uh, I don't with, use, without spot specific. I don't use sinking lines. Um, but you're but you're talking about fishing at night with fly rods. Yeah. Okay. I sight fish a lot of fish at night. Um, sometimes I'll mark them and then turn around and, and drift and cast at them when they're rolling, or dredge do them. Um, but when someone, I, I personally think there should be like a, a educational school because if you're starting out and you're you're going to get, I can't tell you how many times the phone rings and it's, oh, I just spent five days or seven days in the Keys and it was rough and it was windy and I got demoralized and I got yelled at by the guide the whole time and I suck. And I still haven't caught my tarpon, and somebody gave me your number. And uh, you're the fallback guy. A lot of times, and then <laughs> and then they because they don't know. Yeah. And then they figured it out, and now they come in and book five days with me, and and they're like, "Wow, that was that was easier." I but, just don't <laughs> think they realize like what you said about seeing fish or catching fish. I don't think the average person realizes how difficult it is to actually catch an ocean side tarp and swimming down it's the flats. It's really hard. It's extremely hard. Yeah. They, they, they watch a couple of TV shows and go to the fly shop, drive to the keys or fly in there and they're going to go and they're going to duplicate this and they leave just demoralized beaten dogs out I, there. I remember one time a couple of years ago we stopped at uh, Wind dixie and Big Pine we just got done fishing we were grabbing groceries and a guy came over and saw our boat and started chatting with you right and you said he, he said you know I'm not having any success I'm I'm killing myself I can't I can't get a bite and you said let me see what you're using and he had straight 100 pound bite to tip a, it bite oh. tip it Five O hook, five O hook with a four inch chartreuse toad, and he was. <laughs> you were just like, well, let's let's start there, right? Well, also too, look, we love to bait fish. I've got three boats in my backyard. I love throwing the cast net as Nikki does. You know, fishing with mullet and shrimp and crabs. Um, catching tarpon is awesome. Maybe ultimately all we all want to catch tarpon on a, on a good sunny day in the ocean side, seeing them come from 200 yards away. I think that's the ultimate. But the early stages and, and phases of tarpon fishing, we did a lot of night fishing, you know, with, with bait and flies uh, on the coast early in the morning. I think that's a lot of a, a really an important stage where you can learn how to how to actually get the bite and get right. get a hook up and fight a fish when you don't have the skill set to do what we all want to do during the day. And I don't, I, I'm not poo pooing that. It's not. I don't think it's secondary to, to to flats fishing. I just think it's totally different. It is different, totally. but 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 look, <laughs> most people because they see the TV shows, they want to see that bite during the day. I so to it. me, it's secondary. I want to see it. It's but, great. But 
it to me i would rather be on the ocean but if but if i can't catch one in the ocean i'll go at night i'll go early in the morning what's the biggest mistake most people make that you uh, see i would say they can't cast the biggest fly fishing mistake they make they can't get the fly to where the fish are i, I would say that that that's a, a you know in the daytime that's a big one but uh I, I mean, you have you, you. So many people think that they can buy it. You can't buy the experience. You have effort you must put in. And if you want to pick up a fly rod and go, you know, don't care. The fish doesn't care how much money you got in the bank. You show up and you suck. You're gonna know real quick that you suck. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're in the daytime out there, it's it's a, a much harder game. And you know, it's not something that you can tell your secretary to go make that fish eat when that fish doesn't want to eat and you suck at it. And I don't think there's anything that buys time on the water experience. And like I talk about calmness and when you, you know, it's like I've heard Fordyce uh, story that my buddy told me that he would send some of his guys in to fish with a buddy of mine, Jakey. And, uh, and let them catch some fish and get comfortable. You're talking about Jake Jordan. Yeah, Jakey Jordan. Yeah. And uh, let them catch some and get comfortable, get the jitters out of the way, learn the angles, learn how to fight them, you know, like boot camp almost. And then now you've caught your first tarpon. You've yeah. So let me back up. Angles. Let me back you're, up just calmer. a little bit. You're, you're, and then when it comes together, you're, it's not your first time and you're just shaking. and Right. So let me explain this. Jake fishes a certain falling tide at night, so yeah. you're going to get more bites. So that's the learning curve is right. we're make, me, making mention, and I totally get that. Uh, they can catch fish right. a lot I, more readily at night. I, I, again, I, it's the calmness. I, I had one angler that I thought had a heart attack on me, and he didn't have a heart attack. He just lost his mind, and he stopped <laughs> breathing, and I couldn't. he didn't speak English, so I, it was problematic and you start giving uh, mouth to mouth <laughs> um, he's yelling at his buddy <laughs> Hit and him in the chest he, he they just came back from like the jungle of costa rica or something and uh, they were from europe uh, uh russian or something they were speaking and and he he'd fished a jungle for like a week and he caught nothing and somehow they, they were down there and i got my number and they booked while they were here they extended their layover back in florida and i took the guy out and um he's a polish guy and he uh Pol polis polovskiski or something was his name and he lost his shit like he stopped breathing and i started freaking out and he's yelling at his buddy in polish and his buddy's ripping his backpack open and i'm like He's like turning it over and dumping it out. I'm thinking there's like a heart adrenaline shot. Some Pulp Fiction shit's about to happen. He's getting stabbed in the heart. And he's yelling and he's like literally going, uh, uh, and he's not breathing. And and I I took the rod away from him and he's like clawing at me. And I got my hand on his face and I pulled the rod away. I'm like, like get ready to call 911. He's having a medical problem. And and, he, and he's yelling at his buddy, and his, I'm waiting for, like, a heart pill to come out or something to the bag, and he picks up a camera. And I'm looking at the situation now, and he's <laughs> looking at his buddy and yelling at him at Polish, and the guy gets the camera out and starts filming. I'm like, he's he's not dying. He's just stupid. <laughs> he's just excited. <laughs> and he's, I, I hand him a bottle of water, and the fish is just taking a line. I go, stop. You're not allowed to catch the fish until you breathe and start <laughs> drinking some water. And I made him calm down, and he just... I've never seen somebody lose it like that, where he literally would just go on, uh, 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 and not breathing. His it looked like his airway was closed, like he he was having a heart attack, and he just lost his shit because tarpon got him that excited. So again, it's an exciting thing. What have you, Nick? This question to you. I mean, what have you learned from bait fishing that helped your fly fishing? I would just say first that comes to my mind is pulling on fish, just because you get more fish on the line. And you can really learn how to apply pressure and subdue those fish more quickly, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, I'd have to think about others, but for sure it helped my fish fighting capabilities. Yeah. I think it helped me understand uh, how effective it, it is to get that rod tight before you go to set the hook. As a fly fisherman, initially, you see that bite, and I'd always want to like, like, 
like go to strikes too soon with the tip and they you poke them they jump up and fall off the hook but bait fishing that rod can get pretty bent before you even you know go to set that hook and that's i think that's what that's what i learned from it yeah and rodney does not miss Rodney does not miss. He gets doubled over. He's a much calmer angler than most people, <laughs> and he doesn't doesn't make as many mistakes. Um, you know, you talk about all the setting the hook stuff because you're a J hook and a fly. But when you, you know, when you work through the numbers and you start seeing what works better, and the circle hooks are more effective, and then you start trying to figure out how to be the best at catching them on circle hooks. It's all about angles, and there is no setting the hook. And I make flies with circle hooks in them, and I've been using those for a while. And, you know, when a, when you have a novice, it just doesn't get any easier. Right. What about circle hooks during the daytime when you're sight fishing fish on the, on the clear sand? You're talking Chinese to me. <laughs> <laughs> you That's never, I'm going to sleep. You, you've never been there. Oh, I've been there. Yeah. I'm He's not turtle. I'm J hook fishing. That, that's when you're running by the flats. That's when I'm laughing home. at them all, fighting over the spot, swinging push poles at each other, and I was like, "Oh God." <laughs> um, what's the the best the best thing about tarpon that no one knows? Um. I don't know if it's the best thing. It's probably the worst thing is how smart they are, their memory. How, how do you know they have memory? Tell me about some experiences with that. Um, I've caught mul- I've caught the same fish more than once. Did- I've watched how not, you know, like a fleet of boats, but just one boat's footprint can change a fishery. And... Um, I, I'm not saying that I'm good or bad at it, but I'm saying that I know that the amount of pressure that I can put on a school of fish um, is changing the fishery. And I've had to, I've had to. Give me an example how you've changed the fish, a fishery. You know where when I when I was young and I'd roll through there and I'd quad up. And then I'd pitch two more out, and I'd catch a six tuplet, and I'd set them in the rod holders, and look at the guy just to you know to mess him. Like, hey, when you're done, <laughs> you got some more here. To You'd mess have with. six fish on. Oh yeah, big and, big tarpon. Yeah, <laughs> big ones. And uh, I mean, like Marsh, that big one he caught with me. That was a five tuplet, and that fish was you know two fifty or better. I don't know, it was big, but that wasn't a single. Mm-hmm. I caught a quad while we were fighting that one. And uh, that was like an hour later. We were fighting it for so long that I, they started blowing up and coming by me. And I was like, just started firing into him and everything bent over. And his buddy was in the back. And I was like, you just stay up there and do what you're doing. <laughs> but you can't you can't do that anymore. They, they're... They're no longer innocent. If you hook an alpha, it changes the whole dynamic of the spot. It's over. You can hook 70 pounders and it doesn't make as big a difference or 90s or whatever, but you hook mama and you grenade the spot. It's Is that because the boat's moving through the whole school, chasing her down? No, not at all. I could sit totally still, not even start my engine. They did behavioral studies in some of the, the FWC labs, and, and it's the things that I've learned from the scientists are so impressive and how the pecking order works. And when the alpha is removed from the, the equation or, or, or puts out a distress signal, like my, my one client of fish is with me two or three days a week. He, he knows all my jokes and saying, they got the email, we gotta go. And I'll leave because you you know if you hook too big of a fish, it ruins the spot. Do they leave or just not bite? They gen- or you just can't pitch more baits to other they fish. They generally are- leave and, and they get into, you know, I mean, it, it's the same thing that you have happen in the daytime. You just don't see it at night. But I see it where if you hook a fish, you know, and your big string coming down and everything grenades and it just goes to running, you're not going to cast at the school again. It's it's in flight mode. It's It's panicked. 
it's going to take a while for those things to go settle down the line, you know, or when you're not the first boat in the string and, and they've been buggy whipped by four getting to you and they're already all quivering and sketched out and looking around. And by the time you get your shot, you're not getting happy fish. Right. They're already all twitchy and nervous and, you know, a bird flies by and the whole thing, school jumps like they're mullet and they're running. It's when you hook too big a fish and you, and they put out that vibe, it's, uh, it changes the fishery. And if there are sharks in the spot, then they're not comfortable. They're already, you know, they're already kind of nervous and, and the fishery's changing rapidly. And ways I fished and spots I fished three years ago or five years ago or 10 years are all totally, totally different vibes. And the guys that fished the old way are getting skunked. What's the old way? Fish were stupid. They'd eat anything, and you could make noise. You could have a big footprint. Right, right, right. You know, you could you could be the uh, the bull have, in the china shop. Uh, have, now you got to be the ninja. Have you have you personally pushed fish out of out of a certain area where there's no longer fish? Yeah, totally, hundred percent. And when you think back, how is that affecting your fishing from this point forward? It educated me that, you know, I I've I've always been. Um, a very aggressive fisherman and if i have a single on and i always want the double the triple the quad because i want those guys to go home just going holy shit that just happened anybody can catch a single but they don't usually have five tuplets on or six tuplets on and, and when they go home and see that and then you know they come back and come back and come back and it's bit me in the ass where some clients would be like uh so have you stopped doing that now yeah and and not that I don't want to, but for two reasons. You have to. I have to manage the school because I have to work it the next day and the next day. And I know my impact and I know my footprint. And I have to make my living with them. And they, they are uh, an important part of my life. And I, I love them. But so I want to, you know take care of the fishery and i watch when people don't take care of it what happens so i'm very cautious and if the fishery allows you know you can go buck wild and hook 50 or more and you wish you've done oh yeah i mean i <laughs> during the during the covid days it was uh it's pretty special you had the keys but, to the city. I mean, we were hooking 50 a trip, multiple trips in a row. Let me ask you this. And the clients were like, oh, my God, we're going 30 for 52 or something in, in a four-hour. Are you fishing? Are those numbers for you or for them? In the beginning, I wanted to show the consistency. And my, my thought was, you're going to go to a restaurant and spend your money. You want to go to the best one, the most consistent meal. And uh, and it's an ego thing. You want to go be the best, like in any tournament, any football, sporting event, highest score wins. Basketball, highest score wins. So every day I'm always competitive and aggressive, and I always want to catch the most fish that I can for my clients to have the most repeat clients and and have a good reputation but I've had to restrict myself and and learn to be the old bull and sneak in there and pick a few here and then slide over here and pick a few and slide over here and pick a few and slide over here and pick a few instead of rolling there and, and go buck wild and just start ripping through them and uh, and then I'm gonna hurt them and they're gonna they're gonna push and they're gonna be hard to find again. Look, these people most likely are gonna have the time of their lives if they catch two or three, even one, let alone 50. You'd think so. Uh, that's what, that's the problem. That, that's a good question because that's the, what I was going to ask. Yeah, because the problem is they you are your spoiled. own worst enemy. Are you damn right. And I so am. if you do that <laughs> I'm one. The, I'm the worst enemy I have. Because if you do that and you show them that that's the standard. Oh, yeah. The next night you got to catch 30, then 35, then 50. And now the fishery is not going to support it. Yep. And everybody else is going to get fucked because. The fishery is getting too much pressure. And it is getting too much pressure, but it's, I don't think that the human impact on the fishery is nearly as problematic as the water. 
Well, look, that's here. I'm going to. Yeah, I totally agree with you. But let's not get away from the issue we're talking about here. And that is a, a carbon footprint that we are having on a fishery ourselves personally. Yes, the water and the habitat is terrible. But we're talking about educating anglers as to what your abilities. Your abilities are so outstanding. You've already proven it. I've had when a, does the humility come into play and the modesty, and, and you back all that off and that's say, "That's what I've had to do," and, and tell these people, "We're not going to do this anymore to the fishery." Well, what have I've you done had that? is, yeah, and 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 it's, um, you know, I'll have a guy who'll tell me, "This sucks. We only caught seven. Right, and I'll. Like, that's your fault dude and i'll look at him and be like hire anybody you want you know no i want to go with you you know and i was like well you know it, it, the fishery is changing and it is what it is and and again when i was younger i did what the fishery allowed me to do because there were so many fish right but i i think you're missing the point it's not that i don't want to go buck wild it's that i'm older and smarter and like you know i talked to legends like skippy nielsen and one of his clients fished for me one night and uh and he went back down when he fished with skippy and and, uh, and then skippy called me and he's like you you really you really hooked over 50 with stan lee last night and i said yeah it was it was good you know and stanley caught over 20 by himself well his buddy was there he caught one and took a nap but he caught you know a lot and uh, and and then you know when Stanley fished for me another day, and I was in Miami, we were down the Keys, and and he fished a worm in me with me one day, and we had like nineteen, and and it was it was good, it was really really good, and um, uh, and uh, then Stanley would come in in the end of August and catch one or jump three or something. I ain't never coming back here. This sucks. And I was like, it's not even tarpon season and you're complaining. But the thing that I think is the most important thing is to do the best as a responsible angler and captain. And when I watch, you know, there's so much like bait guys versus fly guys. And it's like politics, you know. Yeah, divided. It's a little divided. It's very divided. And then you hear about the guy at the bridge, like, I don't like those guys dead baiting over there, and he's using live bait. And they got fly guys over here complaining about this guy, and that guy's complaining about this guy. And I think that the first thing that we have to look at is our impact as humans on a fishery and then how how much we respect the fish and what the actual numbers of schools of fish are doing. And they're behavior patterns have totally changed and that's where i think that most people don't get it and i'll have a fly guy ask me well, what do you think about those guys bait fishing in the channels and the keys because they're they're catching all the fish and and and, and they're chumming the fish that used to be on the flats and and now they're not anymore and now they're sitting in the channel yeah you're talking about more island marauder channel too where guys are, are no, chunking everywhere everywhere there's everybody's chunking now a lot of places so what is that doing to the it's, flats you a say lot of people now are, look look at in the 50s in key west yeah they were doing a, they were yeah, doing key west harbor i've done that with the shrimp yeah. boat trash yeah, so it's I, not now it's, no yeah no i get it but i think that that whole scenario gravitated up to island marauder and it's been going on for what maybe 20 years yeah because i remember in the fly tournament we set a rule up that you can't be near these guys pile, yeah. that are chunking. And now they want to like possibly go to the FWC and, and try to get some sort of regulation that ch that chunking is not allowed. I think that's Cause, hilarious. Because a lot of flag guys are thinking the fish are not coming down the beach because they're, they're, they're held up at these bait tables under the bridges. I think they're whiny little bitches, personally. <laughs> that's my honest opinion. They don't they want to cast the blame on everybody else and accept none. <laughs> roll, roll from anywhere in the keys to the Everglades and look around. How many skiffs are everywhere on every point, fighting over spots, getting out there in the dark, buggy whipping every poor bastard of a tarpon that swims by? 
Go to the coast at sunrise and look at it. It's There's so much pressure, but if the fish can't hide on the flats in shallow water because he's getting the flats are getting burned because it's rough and everybody's running the flat, and then they're getting cast and hooked and spooked. I mean, you know, I talked to I mean, my neighbor Brewer is a legend. Craig. Yeah, yeah. he's a legend. And, you know, those guys at Fish Basins back there 20, 30 years, 40 years ago can tell you how they have caught fish and, 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 you know, the fisheries, the fish move from one boat's pressure. Like I've seen my own fishery where I catch too many in a spot or I herd them. You know, it's like herding elephants. And I don't think any fly guy ever wants to take responsibility of anything because he's holier than God and he's got a fly rod in his hand. But when they're burning every flat and they're staked out and they're chasing the fish and they're doing everything to catch the fish, the fish doesn't have to put up with the pressure. He mm -hmm. can slide off that channel uh, flat and go sit in a channel. Well, there's two wrongs that are taking place here. And we both have to take responsibility for it. I think a lot of fish in the flats are now swimming a little bit deeper water because a lot of there is so much pressure. The fishing you don't some days you don't see nearly as many. They're there. They're just in deeper water, you know. So the flats guys have pushed them deeper. They run a little bit too close to shore. But they're going to say, "You guys are catching and hooking thirty to fifty a night, and a lot of them are getting shark bit." So everybody's pointing fingers at each other. Everybody's arguing, but it's there's no. I can tell you how many shark bites happen in a season, and how many fish get chased, and how many fish get eaten. And I mean, I'm a numbers guy. I like catching fish. How many shark bites did you have on your tarpon last year? Three. That's all. Yep. How many chased? Lots. I break them all off quickly. What and pound test do you use on your on your rig? On what on, you, on your like, what, what on bait or fly test? or whatever? You know when you're, when you're bait fishing. Normally 50 pounds. And you can break that off pretty easily? Pretty easy as pie. How? It's all it takes. I mean, fish going that way, you stop it. It's Yeah. And when you catch these fish, when, when you have like 30, you know, you catch 30 or 50, you're leadering them, correct? And then you're popping them off. You're not grabbing their face, taking I, the hook out. I tell every client, do not touch the fish. I do not like them to ever touch the fish. And you see the fish... I think that the fly guy with the, 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 the hashtag face grab or the bait guy that wants to face grab or do the shot, I totally disagree with it. And if you look at the majority of my pictures that I try to take, I'm not a jumping fish, but when he's boat side, the guy's got the leader in his hand. If you watch every you know Instagram thing, hold leader, smile, look at me, click. Do not touch the animal. And the main reason why is they don't like to be touched. And frequently, I believe that the fish will jump and shake his head and smash his head into the boat. When he hits his head on the boat, he can damage his gills, his brain, his eyes, and hurt him. And I use barbless circle hooks, and I catch the shit out of them, and um, I try to never let my client touch a fish. And if I'm in a place that does have shark, because there's spots that have none and spots that have more, and some have a lot, I try to not fish sharky spots, and if there are bad sharks here, I try to take care of the sharks. Yeah. How about how about at certain bridges in the Keys? We're talking about sharks. You had three bites last year, and those what are in Miami. We, um, but let's just say if you're down like you know Bahia Honda during the worm hatch, et cetera. There's a lot of bait guys down there. Do you see other guys getting shark bit? Quite a few others. You know. Do they break their fish off like you? What I can tell you is that. Everything has a, a cycle, and when the water's real clear, you just you don't see the sharks. They don't feel like they have that advantage. Mm -hmm. But if the water gets dusty and they think they can sneak up, and the truth is, if 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 we haven't if there's no perfume going as we call it in the channel, then in two weeks the sharks will be back. But if somebody kills a bull shark and sinks them to the bottom and ties them off, every shark in that channel is gone for two weeks. Don't you think there might be, okay, I just had a conversation with Chris Trossett. We were down testing some new hardy fly rods uh, with these guys. And we were speaking about Western dry rocks. Uh -huh. 
in general, not just Western dry rocks. They obviously shut it down. There was a big battle between the Fly Guys and Conservation, BTT, the IGFA, mm -hmm. FWC. They finally got everybody to understand that there were a lot of a lot of guys fishing for permit there, a lot of light tackle guys. I'm very familiar with everything about yeah. it. Yeah, and, and they documented how many of these permit were getting killed by sharks. And I asked Chris, I said, on a daily charter, when you're not even fishing there, fishing elsewhere, how bad are the sharks? What is the what are the percentages of every fish you hook getting lost to a shark? He said we're losing fifty percent of our fish to sharks. And he's talking about like yellowtails or groupers or snappers. Anything or... they anything they hook. I said on on a daily average, how much are you lose really? to sharks? Yeah. So with that being said, so obviously they shut down wet western dry rocks, right? So it was the I fly understand. guys against the offshore guys. How yeah, do you yeah. feel about that? Um again if if you walk out your front door and bears tear you in half arm and leg and they rip you to pieces are you going to say oh man we have a bear problem or are you going to say oh we should just all hide in our houses i i've seen the shark population explode in stewart when the guys are sail fishing in palm beach I watched the kite clip come down and the sail come up and jump three or four seconds and sharks are cartwheeling on them. It's a problem. And they got guys out there feeding them, the shark divers. The wrecks in the keys, when I'm trying to catch a grouper or a snapper or an amberjack, uh, especially if you're trying to mutton fish around spots, you can't fish big structure the majority of the time, unless it gets really cold or something happens. If you fish those structures, your chance of getting shark bit are really high. So you got to try to fish like little secret rubble spots and stuff like that. Um, was it right for the FWC to shut down Western Red Rocks for that period of time when the permit are spawning out there and all these other species that are, that are spawning? I'm not. Because your voice is coming from a light tackle guy. I'm not. How do I say this? Um, I'm not in favor of closing any fishery and taking away any fishermen's rights ever. Even when they're losing so many fish to sharks? I think they should kill the damn sharks. I think we should manage things properly. Um, I think that if you have a pile of wild bears sitting at your dumpster killing everybody, if you do it through the trash out, it's uh, they usually relocate that bear or do something to him. Um, and everybody is all about save the sharks. When I go and fish in the Bahamas... Uh, the sharks are ravenous. Yeah. And I fished there my whole life. I fished the Keys my whole life. But isn't the shark problem a result of the longliners no longer being able to longline? Because they used to kill a lot of sharks, the longliners. I think that... When they banned longlining I mean, the sharks. I'm, I'm not an expert on the subject, but I can tell you that uh, if you want to look at how smart the government is, look at Red Snapper. <laughs> There's, they're like mosquitoes in the Everglades and they're an endangered species because there's some scientist drops some trap in the sand and says, oh, they're endangered. We didn't get any in our fish trap. And a spot that, you know, wouldn't even have them. And then they come back with a study that says some, some scientific data that they're endangered. Uh, I can only tell you what I see. And as a fisherman and a conservationist and an and a outdoorsman, our biggest issue that I see we're facing is water quality. The flats are dying. The grass is dying. It's brown. The fish are not rising and feeding on shrimps and crabs at night in the channels like they used to because there's no food moving. The amount of fish that are traveling 20 years ago versus 10 years ago versus now, how many fish come into spots in Miami and come into spots in the Keys is greatly reduced. And I don't believe that it is because they've all been eaten by sharks or they've been eaten by humans. I believe that these fish can go whenever they want. When I'm in Costa Rica tarpon fishing, I mean, the best fishery in the world is Venezuela for tarpon. I mean, it's ridiculous. In Trinidad and Tobago, I mean, like, all the mouth of the Amazon stuff there is off the chain. Better than Miami. Are you kidding me? Venezuela fishery, my, my buddy, they, they had 350 of them in five days or something the last time they fly fish down there. That's a four-hour charter for you. 
<laughs> no, I'm serious. Like that that fishery is, is is that small small tarpon or are they adult sized tarpon? He wasn't targeting big ones. He was fly fishing, but um, they were catching you know, thirty pounders, forty. So pounders. it's like Campeche in Mexico. I think it's way better. Um, there's no pressure, and but they're and all smaller fish. Not all. He was up in the estuary if you slide out to the mouth they're all big he didn't want to mess with those as you know yeah as a tarpon guy big fish are always that you know everybody jokes they want to catch a hundred pounder they want to catch a 200 pounder they hook one and three hours they look at you going dude really (laughs) i didn't think this thing through i didn't know they fight this hard well we all agree that there's a major water issue uh that's being confronted and, and and fought for by captains and clean water and everybody else we're fishermen how do we manage what we fish for and with? I think that, and when I when I when you have so many sharks and all these, I feel terrible for the offshore captains when they're losing fifty percent of the fish they hook to sharks. They're feeding sharks, and I agree with you. And then and then the sharks get more aggressive. They they learn behavioral patterns, and the boat shows up. Here come the sharks. Some spots when I'm in Cat Island and I'm Blue Marlin fishing. I could take the boat out of gear on the point and put it in reverse and go, hoo, hoo, and just a couple engage with the throttles and look over the side and the white taps are they're just circling me. So is there a movement to try to like assess the problem and, and figure out with the fishing game how how we might be able to to understand and work with these sharks a little bit better? Honestly, I don't know. Um, the science side of what they're trying to do to manage the shark problem. You know, when the mosquitoes are bad, you spray for mosquitoes. When other animals are bad, you do things to reduce their numbers. I don't know the way and in, in the world we live in to for for the average person to understand that there's too many sharks. I don't think that restricting an American from being an outdoorsman and going fishing at dry rocks or someplace else is the solution. I think that understanding the problem is the first solution and not saying, you know, oh, well, you caused a prop scar. You shouldn't be allowed in the Everglades. You, you know, you have a four stroke motor. It's bad. You should have an electric motor. You shouldn't be able to do this. You shouldn't be able to do that. And all our freedoms are being taken away, and, and I don't, I'm not a fan of that. Um, I think that I spend a lot of time on the water with these animals. And the things that I see happening are, and, you know, uh, uh, um, how would I say it? I sound like a douche, is someone who doesn't have as much experience with them would say I didn't see him today or catch him today because they're all gone or there's less here but when they leave way earlier than they should and they all show up in Boca Grande and when those school of fish have already left to go spawn and all of a sudden a new bat shows up that's starving and is gorging on the crabs and the north bounders aren't happening I, I, I'm only using my logic as to what's going on i'm not looking at tag data on all the studies but i think that the fish show up in miami and south florida and palm beach i mean up the vero and everywhere else and they winter when it warms up they leave and head for the keys the winters are lighter they warm up and leave and come in earlier to the keys and the guys that have always had their set schedules i'm going to be here at this month i'm going to be here at this week at this date Look what happens in the Keys when the weather gets nice way too early for tarpon season. Look mm-hmm. how many tarpon show up. Sure. And, and those are all residents. I, I don't I know. Don't think so. I think a lot of times you have uh, cold weather uh, that push them down into the Gulf. You yeah. Know, I yeah, mean, no, I agree. I just I, I listened to you on a recent podcast, and it was fascinating for you to explain the fishery in Miami and why these there's so many fish in government cut. In Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale, Key Biscayne, and you were talking about the Gulf Stream and the That's the my reef, theory, the yeah. reef edge. But it makes sense. You mind speaking about that? I mean, if you look at a map, the fish to the north all sit in the inlets and around the mouths or up in the intercoastal. But you know, Fort Pierce has a you know a, a big bay up there, 
And then when you leave there, there's just a narrow little strip of water all the way down with canals and some rivers that come off it, but there isn't much infrastructure. And when you get to Miami, it's like the keys start. You know, you have an outer island, you have Biscayne Bay. And if you look at the temperature differences between Stewart or Miami on a cold night, it gets colder way quicker up there. And whenever over the years I see the big fronts coming and it's blowing northwest at 35, I'm just going, oh, kids are on the way. And, you know, and it's, you know, 40 something with a wind chill and people are like, the last thing they're thinking about is tarpon fishing. I'm just salivating going, oh, it's about to go off. Because of the the, the shrimp patches? Or, or, or no. The colder food. temperatures. No, it's going to push them down. No, I understand it's yeah, going to push them down. But right. also, too, you have two things happening. The shrimp hatch, when you have that cold front, right? And you have the fish coming and, in. And, and frequently that doesn't happen. It's not a shrimp hatch. It's just fish going, it's too damn cold, I'm boogieing, and they make a run for it. You will catch way more fish if there is no other damn shrimp in the water, if there's no other crabs in the water, mullet in the water, than ones in your hook. When there is a lot of food, if you're in the mullet run and you throw your bait in there, oh, yeah, thousands of mullet, you're like, maybe eventually he's going to bite it. But when um, when you have a lot of happy kids show up, and there's just, if if you have a trickle of bait is the best because that right. gets them up and sniffing and looking. It. It's same like a worm hatch. We notice our best fishing ones when they're just it's all the maybe same. the night before the big hatch and they're in there looking, and yeah. everyone you throw to they bite it. When you know this year uh, the hatch was great and um and and I and it was funny because like a buddy of mine said something to me. Yeah, I saw some fish over here and I was like really, and. uh and you know, there's the standard spots that everybody crowds into. And I, I stopped at the spot he was talking about, and I slowed down, and I was checking it. And I was like, it's kind of a night spot, and it's interesting. And and there's, there's a good bit of fish sipping over here, and they're all. The problem was they're all pretty big. And uh, so we said, Why would that be a problem? I don't like big fish. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you can't so I mean, catch them fast enough? No, and you got a dude. Who, I had a guy from Alaska. He was a trout guy. He'd never caught one. He's losing his shit. He's hooking up and he's shaking, you know, and the weeds. And it was like, you know, I, he needs to catch like some 60 pounders or 50s. You know, he needs to break into it. Yeah, you know, and he goes right into blistering broken fingers and shit flying through the air. And he's like, I'm just panicking and the fish comes at him and you're not stripping and it's like all right we'll get the next one but you know just to see that mm -hmm. is what you come for and i went down when i took a little break we 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 chased one and broke him off and and went down and and i, and I sat over at the uh at, at the the herd of boats and i was kind of sitting there and i was just analyzing it for a minute and i talked to my buddy forrest for a second and i was like what's going on and i'm watching it and I and I just give him a nod. I go, dude, it's it's better. It's better. You want to follow me? I'm I'm out of here. And and I left the the yeah. standard spot. I made a run and uh, I sat back over there and had a had a great trip. And then we rolled back in at the end of it. You know, when our ours dried up and and it was like there was still a trickle going over there. And we went in there and milled around and tried to get a a bite out of one. I think we got one more or something, but. I, I don't like being in the group of people. I mean, I've I've been driving before, and you know I'm trying not to get an accident. My head's on a swivel every bridge I go over, and I'm like, oh, look at this rolling right there. They're they're on the way, and I've launched and put the hammer down and run five ten miles away from everybody, and sit there and just waiting and looking. And there they are. And then and then that was like that time with Stanley and we got in a boat at the dock and I was like, we're out of here. And he's like, well, what do you mean we're leaving? This is the spot and we're going. And I showed back up at dark at the spot and I'd already caught a shit ton of fish from my guy and he was blown away and we weren't anywhere near all the other Googans. Nice. Well, I want to talk about the worm hatch here in a second, but before we get there, I want to just wrap up the whole shark thing. Yeah. How do you feel about Boca Grin? We're there so many sharks are eating so many tarpon you know you say that and uh you watch tv and you say so many so I, many i've been there i've been there and 
and they I are getting eaten. I, I'm not disagreeing with you that sharks don't eat fish, but I think what people think. Do you think that a permit doesn't die at a wreck or western dry rocks any day of the year, but the day the fisherman hooks it? Did the sh sharks starve to death in the whole world, and then you hook a fish and eat it? They've made their living by eating other animals, just as other animals in the wild have forever. It's what they do. Um, so I would say that in Boca Grande, personally, I have friends that fish there. When I went over there, I didn't like it. It's not my vibe. I don't like humans, and I don't like that many humans crowded around me when I'm trying to work. That's why I like fishing at night. I want to get away from people and have right. No, I understand peacefulness. That. And when those sharks get bad in a spot, I leave the spot. But but this is what's happening here. On I saw on an Instagram this year, in the middle of the day, a captain, paid captain, said we hooked twelve, we lost six to sharks. I think I just find that despicable. I agree with you. If I lost six tarpon to a shark, I I would be dropping dynamite in the water and going home. And that happens every day with with a lot of guides up there. And I hear that general statement. I don't know if I don't know the guys. The guys that I know that I talk to that fish there, are one of the best of the best there. And that's like the little circle of people that I try to talk to and find out what the real story is. And he's the one telling me. Dude, all these fish just showed up here, and I'm catching them, and the season's over, and there's ravenous pods of fish. And then when I talk to my friends in the Keys, that there's no northbounders, there's no northbounders. And all of a sudden, all these fish show up at Boca Grande, and when he's catching them, they're all full of sperm. And these are fish that should have spawned out. And I think, in my opinion, what's happening is the fish come in, they congregate in South Florida on the East Coast and the West Coast. And from what I understand, I'm not a scientist, a tarpon will not spawn unless it's built up its fat content. Right? So, like, I could spawn, but you guys might not be as good. <laughs> so, um, the female has to gorge herself. Okay. And I think this is the biggest issue that everybody wants to talk about a shark or about this or about that. For that female to spawn, she understands her biology, okay? She picks the suitable male. They, she gorges herself. She puts on the fat content. When she goes out to spawn on the sword grounds where there's makos ripping through them and stuff out there a lot, um, they dive down. And, and the tags show that at about 200 feet deep, and there could be in 2,000 feet of water in the Atlantic, the fish turn what we think belly to belly, and she squirts out her eggs, he squirts out his sperm, and they get sperminated. Where does that concept come from? They face each other belly to belly. Well, that's, I mean... Because that... I've seen, you know, like bonefish, they circle, right. they drop right. eggs, uh, the sperm... You know, and the milk is created. I mean, they they it's, could it's be tornadoing, but but you're saying here though, a female picks a male. Yes, hundred percent to mate with. Yes, it's not just a, a large population of females and males circling, I, dropping eggs and sperm. I'm not a scientist, but from the scientists that I've talked to and looked at the studies from and what they've told me, because that would make sense, right? Um. Like a bull and female dolphin that travel together, when the female picks her male by his level of hydration and spermination, so she, like when the dogs butt sniff and the, and the tarpon butt sniff when they're daisy chain and that social behavior and they're, they're doing all the pretty things you like to see, I think that they're selecting each other to be an appropriate pair. And I can't tell you how many times I've hooked a, a, a nice size fish and Mark and the male and I'll tell the client here watch this the, the boyfriend's hanging out with her yeah we see that all the time on the mm -hmm. class too and it's not and, and I think that's the male that that, it, that was picked to spawn with her and then you catch her and let her go and they go back their way together but when they go to spawn the point is that they push offshore and they do that run pretty quickly 
they get out there, they dive down, the eggs get sperminated, and she'll drop four to eight million eggs from what the scientists tell me. Those eggs are little clear droplets with a, like a little drop of oil in, in a balloon. And that's the fat. And the fat causes the egg to float to the surface and with the trade winds blow back in. And I think that she knows that if she doesn't have the fat content built in her egg, that she can't spawn. Because if she does, the eggs are going to sink. They're not going to float. And the fish have to feed and gorge themselves. And again, I spend basically every single night on the water with these animals in a lot of different places over a hundred miles area. And the food content isn't there. And I tell my clients that they're going to leave early because you cannot feed an army. You can't keep an army. And the fish that show up in the Keys are not stringing up northbound quicker. They're, they're not doing what they used to do. And I, th I think that they're leaving and not going offshore to spawn in the Keys frequently because they need the food. And I think that they're doubling back and bumping back into Boca Grande after the seasons are over or other places, wherever the forage is. You know, when I fish in Costa Rica and other places and in, in, in the Gulf, they have all these big schools of fish. There's no reason that they have to go to spot A or B or C. There's lots right. of other places or schools of fish. They can go have lots of food and eat. And I think that our fish talk to other fish like, hey, how was Costa Rica? Hey, how was Texas? How was this? How was Mexico? Yeah, we got a lot of food. We didn't have a lot of pressure. All right, well, let's let's not do our, our winter pattern here. Let's 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 step back and, and maybe go somewhere else because they don't have to go anywhere. And I think they go where the food is. So I, I believe that our fish are leaving earlier. And I think it's made the the quote unquote northbound style, you know, I'm talking about fishery much tougher especially those later season tournaments. Um, I have friends in St. Augustine that fish up there by the shrimp boats and they're seeing large amounts of fish showing up a month, month and a half earlier than they've ever seen before. And the guys in the Gulf are seeing a lot more fish show up later than they're used to, like their normal fish go and come. And that's my theory is that if they can't build their fat content, whether it's sharks and human pressure that make them unhappy, the food isn't there. And when the bay isn't healthy and it can't produce the shrimp and the crabs and the pinfish and the mullet and the pilchards and the things that they want to eat, they they go somewhere else and find it. It's I got two things here. I, I mean, I've I've noticed, and I think Nikki can agree with this. We've seen tarpon fishing, and sometimes the fish leave earlier if we've had a really warm winter. Because yeah. they get there earlier. Of course. Um, and then after that full moon in May, uh, and then the new moon in June, they're gone. Gone. June uh, is dead. There's yeah. nothing left. There's nothing left. Uh, the patterns have changed. How important do you think the worm hatches are and these worms are for these fish to eat? I think it's not important. I, I, I don't know. I think it's a social behavior thing. I think it's a, a Halloween party they like to go to. To eat the candy? You know, that's what I think. Mm. And I, it's I, just coincidence that it, it, it sometimes falls on when they're going to spawn? I think that traditionally the, the way that it's always worked was there was a cycle that animals followed. And as, as the world is changing and the winters are more mild and it gets hotter quicker and the fish are moving faster... You know, when you stick around for the second wormy, look how many fish are there. There's hardly any. Mm -hmm. And I think everything shows up quicker. And, and the old patterns that they followed that, that was what they liked to do. But if, if between the first and the second moon, the food isn't there, watch how fast those fish leave. And after the first one, everything comes in earlier, everything leaves earlier. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden it shows up somewhere else way earlier. And sharks don't help it. So you don't think these worms play a role in in the spawn? I think they do, but when you look at, let's take Boca Grant. 
the, all the fish go in there, the scientists tag them, they leave on a certain day and tide, they push offshore out in the Gulf, and they go sit out there and they spawn. They do the exact same thing without the worms. There's no worms. Right. Yeah. Look at other places that no, they do No, it. I get that, but I just see, you know, it, it's almost like... But it's almost to like what Russ is saying. It's more about the fat content and gorging themselves well, rather than the actual pull of the worm. I, I get yeah. that, but why would these fish all congregate towards these worm bars during that moon? And I'm thinking maybe, maybe the worms and the fat content or the protein of the worm has something to do with that spawn. Because they really want to be there eating these worms, and they're, they're that big. But maybe if there was 10 million little shrimps, you replace the worms with shrimp, and they'd be doing the same thing. Right, but I'm talking about the worm hatch, and they all all these fish want to be there at these bridges right. no, to, I understand. to eat a worm this big. Where do all the kids want to be on Halloween? Well, these are not kids. These are animals. So it makes sense that, they, that there's got to be something to these worms that make these fish go crazy. I'm thinking it has to do with with the spawn in that moon. I I don't think so. I I think I think it does and it doesn't. I think in the old days when the traditional weather patterns happen, that was the pattern they got used to. You know, like they talk about the elephants in Africa eating the rotten fruit, and then they go and they mate because they get drunk from it. Um, when I watch the fish's behavior, you know. I don't want to say too much because it'll make it too crowded, but uh, <laughs> I've had um, exceptional worm fishing at three in the morning on an incoming tide right? in places that you would income. never think. Yeah. They're like, oh my God. You know, because I don't sleep, I, I get to see weird things and I've seen epic incoming hatches. I've seen spots that you would never think there'd be a worm hatch and they're loaded and lots of happy fish. I've seen a lot of different behavioral patterns, and I think a tarpon is a very opportunistic feeder. It's yeah. going to eat a scrap off a fillet table. It's going to eat a mullet, a crab, a chunk of shit on the bottom, a worm, a shrimp, a glass minnow, a pilchard. They're just here to gorge themselves. And I think how quickly they can learn is what we need to understand is the most impressive feature of them. There was, uh, they, they were doing an otolith study at this, uh, from what I understand, they, they, there was three tarpon that were brought to this, to the scientists, put them in a above ground, like in ground pool, I think it was. And they injected them with a chemical in the otolith, the ear bone. 365 days, we're going to feed them, we're going to pull them out of the water, we're going to cut the otoliths out, we're going to look at the age growth study, and we're going to see how much that fish grew from the stain of that chemical we injected. They were pets, conditioned, trained, hand-fed for a year, right? Happy little kids. Scientist throws in a hook with a piece of bait, fish jumps, throws the hook. The pets aren't in the game anymore. They spend all day trying to catch them. They call the guy who brought them to them. He says, try live bait, try fluorocarbon, try this. They want their study to be scientifically accurate at 365 days for the growth study. They can't catch them. So they try everything. He shows up with bait and everything can't catch them. They drain the water down in the thing and they shoot them with spear guns and the study's three days late because they wouldn't eat nothing. And from one time that the fish jump and lost his confidence they no longer trusted what was going on mm -hmm. and that's where to be a better fisherman you have to realize that when you hook a fish and sting them and jump them off you're educating them sure and and spots that i i could sit there before when there was more fish around and and it's like if you dive to some of the reefs they're dead right there's this bacteria, it's killing the corals, it's the water. And then the scientists say, oh, you're not allowed to anchor here because the reefs are all dead. Well, like One anchor didn't destroy everything. It's, it's a water issue. But they want to point the blame at something else than the government not you know, dumping in chemicals and, and causing the problems. These fish learn so fast. And I don't know how to explain to you, but I can 
vibe them. I can feel them. I understand their happiness. Somehow I, I can look at them and know exactly like what they're doing, how they're happy, what, what we can do. And, and I've had to learn how to slide in and pick one and, 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 and then like troll and motor away and not even start up and just be as gentle as possible. And, and just, you know, as subtle and quiet and ninja like as possible. And then maybe come back an hour or two later and catch him uh, another one in that spot or more, because if I catch one fish, especially if it jumps like near the other fish, you threw a grenade in there for a solid hour. Right. See, the fly fishermen have it a little bit differently for the most part because we're fishing for fish that are migrating, coming right. down the shoreline. So you jump one, that group is gone, or those three are gone. Yeah, but the next batch that but, comes in got jumped by the guy before you. But and... but I've seen it out in the Gulf of Mexico when you run out there, you know, really in, early in the dark and you're surrounded by 500,000 right. fish. I've never really seen a fish that's jumping through the school bother them that much. You st because there's so many fish, you just keep sliding. You have, you know, fresh fish. But you're talking maybe small little basins that you're that you're talking about. Uh, it could be an inlet. It could be the ocean. It could be. Uh, um, there are situations, especially water clarity, plays a big role in it. Mm -hmm. When when the water's too clear it's the kiss of death and and when they're when the water clears up they, even at night they ball up oh yeah i mean if i can look down and see the shadow of my boat on the bottom and 15 feet of water i leave you're toast and don't you put your boat in gear when you're drifting so your propeller doesn't spin yeah i can't it doesn't i hate it spinning now my new motor is digital so i can't so i just trim it up very interesting. And, and you were speaking on the tarpon's eyesight and how they can see color. They can see like 10 Again, times the amount. I'm repeating what I've learned from scientists. And according to what they say, there's nothing in the world that swims that sees better than a tarpon. Is that right? They're 5,000 times better vision than our vision. The UV rays that give us skin cancers, they can see penetrating the water. The two best colors that stand out is that purple violet and the chartreuse and their color spectrum but like their rainbow of colors is so vast that our eyes can't see it like a dog whistle we can't hear and so i've tried to step back and say all right we're the dumbest creature out here and we're trying to catch the smartest creature out here so to do so we have to understand that superman looks like everybody else but he's superman he's got x-ray vision he's got all this cool stuff so if we want to catch superman we gotta be really sneaky do you ever feel bad for the fish only um if if like a fish jumps and, and hits his head on the boat or something like that then i, I feel like, oh, you know i've had a lot jump in the boat and i kind of feel bad for them but they're they're making a mess and i do my best to quickly get them back in the water but but if you have a day where you catch 30 or 40 and your client is just so stoked, gives you a fat tip and everyone's high five and he goes back home and in the back of your brain, you're not like... Zero. I don't... If I hurt the fish, you know, if I was fishing yeah. a J-hook and he was coming up pumping blood or something like that, I would feel tremendous remorse. But to fish a barbless circle hook and... I'm like a fly on his back of his lifetime, you know. I rolled in there, he ate a bait, he came up and jumped. I ran him down, I grabbed lead and broke him off. In the Keys or in other places that are bad, uh, if water temperature is too warm, I don't let my clients fight them for any period of time. I try to be as responsible as possible. What's your cutoff number for a long fight? depends how big the fish is and how what channel i'm at where i'm at how deep it is if there are sharks if it's safe in miami i have the longest fights because sometimes i'm in deep water and it's cold i had one fish that i felt really bad about and i spent about an hour trying to revive it and i looked for it for the next two days to see if it died and um i couldn't find it so i think it lived but 
like anything, when you're too old and too fat and too big, I think animals have heart attacks. And I've had blue marlin just die on me that weren't tail wrapped. There's no lines on their body. They just made blistering runs. And, and um, it was probably the biggest one I ever caught. And uh, and it was on, on a 40 pound leader and a three aught circle hook on a little mullet, little finger mullet. And it wasn't, it was on a little 5,000. Like it wasn't any kind of heavy tackle and the fish I was trying to catch a 30 pounder for my for my wife and you know she caught a little one and I was like well let's just finish the drift and we'll go home and 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 uh, I saw it head shake and I was like oh crap like I saw like a little swirl and I was like yeah that thing's probably like 80 pounds this isn't going to end well we're going to break him off pretty quick it's light leader he's going to chafe it through or something will happen and she's fighting it and and I left the other three rods out and I was like finishing my drift so I cleaned it all up and she's fighting it and and she got a look over the side at it. And she's like, honey, honey, this thing is way bigger than what I've ever seen you catch with your clients. And she caught when we measured it was 203. And uh, and I was like, it's bigger than the big one you caught? And she says, yeah. And I was like, no way. Like, I saw that thing flash. Like, it was like 80 pounds, maybe. And um, the whole thing wasn't 15 minutes. And it, was a, it was a very short fight, especially for a creature like that. And it jumped on my port corner and it came out of the water and I was like, holy crap, this thing is really big. And, uh, you know, just nice big head shake, you know, three quarters of the fish in the air. And then, I, and then I'm like looking around and my boat has blood on it from the engine cowling to the bow. Wow. And I was like, I think this thing, like maybe when it jumped, it ripped a gill loose. And the scientists say that they have a valve that controls each gill. So if you cut your juggler, you bleed out. They can turn that valve off and stop that gill from bleeding and control their blood flow. Is this a theory or it's a fact? Scientists tell me that's a fact. Wow. And um, that fish was lips up, tail down on the side Popsicle. of the boat. And yeah, just stone cold Steve Austin dead looking, hanging there. And I grab it. And a circle hook sitting right here, a little three zero, and and I, and I just started swimming it, and I turned on the side, and I was like, "Holy shit, this thing's big!" And I just started motoring, and and I probably motored for probably ten minutes, and I was just so sad. I was like, "God, this thing! I think it just had a heart attack, or if it if when it was shaking so violently, it popped a gill out, and it, and, and it." It probably took 10 minutes of almost no response and, and not just dragging the fish. I literally right. just, just hardcore moved them back and forth and I started feeling a little bit of jaw movement. And I, I, I don't know how long we towed the thing, but I went back and forth and just towed it around and, and just finally got it to where it was supporting itself and moving its jaw a little bit. And I didn't want to measure it because it was probably one of the biggest ones I ever caught, but um, I, I didn't think it could take any more stress. Right. So I plucked the scale off of it and um, and and I and I just swam it for a How while. How big do you think that fish was? At the time, I, I didn't know. Um, but after you, when you measure a lot of them, like the one that Marsh caught was, was really big. And the one Timmy caught was really big. I've caught, I've been very lucky to catch some big ones. And um, that one may have been the all tackle. World record? Oh, yeah. 280? Oh, bigger. 290? Yeah, yeah. Where was this caught? Miami. Get the fuck out of here. Two, 300? It was big. What it's year big. was this? Five or six years ago. Didn't they net one in Hillsborough Inlet, 300 pounder? Uh, they did. I think they netted one at, at, at Boca Inlet. I was 285, I think, or yeah. Hillsboro. You know, when but I was, you're actually saying that you yeah. had on hook and line possibly a 300 pound tarpon. I put it in my hands and swam it for 45 minutes trying to keep the bastard alive. Uh, Good Lord. I don't know how big it was. I didn't kill it. I didn't hang it up, but it was big. It was ridiculously big. Um, I know the 203 that she caught, we measured that one and whatever, how close those numbers are, whether it was a 180 or a 210, it, the numbers of the site, the, the BTT stuff came in 203. BTT is way too, too big. Those numbers don't work. 
I, I don't. I think the length, length, the girth squared times the length divided by eight hundred is a little bit more accurate than BTT. But anyway, they're, and they're I, I, big fish. I would not disagree with you. Um, but then, you know, when I did tagging with Jerry Alt and stuff and the scientists, and and I'd say, "How big's that?" And I was like, "I don't know, ninety pounder." And they'd measure them all up, and and uh, he'd be like, "Oh, it's one oh four And I was like, it "Didn't look like it to me," you know, but. Um, and I, I would say that so far, the worst fish handlers I've ever seen in my life are scientists. They're, they've got a harpoon and a handle that they're putting that tag in with that if they don't catch the angle right, spines them and kills them. You've seen fish die because of scientists sticking yeah. them with tags? And the sharks ate them. And we got the tag back full of shark bites and I... I try to be very, very careful with my pets, and I don't want to hurt them. I love them, and they keep me in business. And I don't, uh, I don't let people touch them. I, I caught one this year for a blind guy, and it was one of the most special fish. And he, and he was like wanting to touch it, you know. And, and I was like, just be careful. You know, it's it's a big fish. He he may. Um, he may mess you up. You know, he was like 80 years old and, and blind, and it was his first, or second time. We just caught him before that was his first. Oh, you saw the video. It was pretty, it was pretty special. And the guy was crying and hugging me, and and that fish was like buck 75 and uh, 200. It was, it was big. Um, but uh, what's the good news, bad news with tarpon tagging, in your opinion? I think the more we can learn, the the smarter we can be. Um, I think. Is there a point that we've tagged enough and we stop tagging? I, I don't know. Uh, again, I, I don't know how much data they have. I know that they were doing tags, and then we did um, the scrub things, and I've caught the same fish that I scrubbed, and uh, we were plucking scales and putting in envelopes and I would joke with them, you need bigger envelopes and they were like, yeah, right. And then I, <laughs> you what, they wouldn't fit in the envelopes on the scales. And, uh, um, and you know, my, one of my friends on the West coast is, is incredibly smart about tarp and he's way smarter than me. And, uh, and he was seeing pictures of some of the fish I was catching, and he's like, I wonder if these are the Africa strain that, that you're catching that are making the Atlantic loop. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, look how big their mm -hmm. shoulder is behind the head, and they don't look normal. And Are they different colored? Are they darker or lighter, greener? That just depends on the fish. water you catch them in. Yeah. But I would say that uh, dumb luck had a lot to do with it, but I... You know, because because they do you talk about the African strain in in Gabon, they catch the biggest fish. That's the what, world record all tackle is say, caught yeah. there. Yeah, but Patrick. again, we had a couple of big fish. You caught one. A few others have been caught, and there is there is reason to believe that there are different genetics in these fish. I, I don't know. I I think that uh, you know it's funny because I you know. As a human, we only can believe what we've seen and what we know. And, you know, as fishermen, we all have egos and we have a hard time believing that somebody else caught something bigger than us. And if I lived in the Keys my whole life, I would have thought a 200 pound tarpon was the Holy Grail. Like, on, you know, in on my fly, life, that on my was lifetime. the Holy Grail on fly forever. Yeah. And um, but I've, a, I've caught him over 200 on fly and uh you have yeah where miami miami all my big fish come out of miami i caught one big one in the everglades but my client johnny jk caught one um yeah, it was really big and uh at night on fly yeah and over he, 200 oh yeah he uh what pound tips tip it it was his rod he he brought it and set it up i think he's he's he fish he has a lot of world records um he is quite a few snook records and other stuff uh very interesting and um and and that fish i mean it wasn't a record because i touched a rod we did things like right you know that just that, caught a big fish yeah we're just fun fishing um and i didn't have the tags like the last world record i caught on fly we were fishing for it we had the tags and we had everything and we purposefully went with that it was a woman's world record and you yeah. waited on the beach Yes. Tell us about that. 
Um, she, how big was the record she was targeting? Not big. It's on what pound? Jody's is a, a hundred pounder on on twenty. Okay, it's not like it's a you know the hardest thing ever caught or something. Just it, and who was it? The Jody has the Pate had the. Oh, the, it's Jody Pate. Yeah. Oh, okay. She yeah. has the. the she had not, the previous record. Right, and we broke it. Oh, you broke her record. Who was yeah. the person that was trying to ca- break that record? Allison, a client of mine in Palm Beach, um, and then the record was denied because we videoed it. And we didn't submit it with a, uh, a still photograph, you know, the, the kill shot. Well, you have to have, I, I, I know, because people have sent in records uh, where the tippet has tested. But if you don't follow the actual uh, requirements of certain measurements with photographs, rods and reels etc i i it's brought a protocol i brought the nets and the harnesses and the rods and i pre-tested the line i used their scale i did everything beyond to the t except we didn't do like the dead fish shot we filmed it on video the whole thing and then when i we netted the fish um with a dip net i built a dip net that i could dip net you and no problem I can fit a 300 pounder in it. It's huge. And, uh, and I brought it to the IGFA. It met all requirements of handle lengths and everything they wanted. And I built a harness, like a stretcher. Because you wanted was, to keep the fish alive. I was not going to gaff it or kill it. And they've never had a fish over 100 pounds caught for a world record that wasn't killed. And I said, I'm, I know where they are. And I'm not going to go kill one for, for a, record. a piece of paper. You know, yeah, it's fine. I've caught the snuckle record and we let it go, it, you know, on two pound. It. So we went, and I was like, we're not going to do it the easy way. Just reach out and stroke them and, you know, hang them up and be like everybody else. So we caught it, and we netted it, and then we took the fish out of the net and looked at it and measured it and said, this one's going to, man, it wasn't huge. It was like 121 or something. But it was enough, you know, and I didn't want to break it by too much so that it would be too hard for another client that wanted to break it. And I was like, that was perfect. And we put the zip tie in it and had it in a little sling and and brought it. Um, so we possessed it now, which was a you know there's a lot of regulations and that once you're in, in possession. So we put yeah. the zip tie on them once we decided that we were going to weigh the fish. And I had the the scale all set up, and I'd built a uh, an apparatus <laughs> that wasn't strong enough because the fish was so hot in the harness that when i was trying to live was swimming and it broke the welds on the on the davit arm and it, and, it, and it all came down and i was like fuck so <laughs> i had wow. to come up with a certain solution because i built a, a system to weigh the fish from a boat legally and everything was you know pre- wait 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 I, shh, yes i said it and um but that's but you had to be on ground yeah i thought you could weigh, weigh it on the boat you can't weigh a fish you found a way i found a way and i did it was your boat grounded run it up on something the beach like that. you ran it up on the <laughs> beach i did something that um and i built something that it was all going good but the fish was just too green and all of a sudden the boat starts getting dragged backwards and it got the wrong angle on the pipe and it broke the weld and she came down and i was like crap so i just turned around and i Moved the boat around the corner and and uh, threw the rope over the tree and I set the scale up to that and we just lifted it out of the water, hung it up, and then put it right back in the water. You know, we videoed and still photoed the the fish being weighed and still. And again, my purpose was to not hurt the fish. So I mean, other than maybe knocking some slime off it, I figured that's a lot better than stroking it with gaffs. This the you netting. Did. But with all that being said, you you had the right intent. But we all know how sensitive tarpon are. Again, I, I agree. I, I always, I've killed a lot of fish in tournaments, and I feel badly about it. And it's great now that the tournaments, you have to you know, measure those fish in the water. And I think the kiss of death, you know they're going to die when they burp. You've heard that when they gurgle, you know, when you've got them. You how, know. Why, why is it you think that? Because all the fish I have had, you know, that were popsicled and they gurgle and they burp it's like if they can't swim and they're hanging there in the water column and it takes 30 minutes to get them just to open and close their mouth and they slide off 
I don't think those fish live. I think I don't that, think they make it. I think they're going to get predated upon because you've beat them down so much. Right. That they're not healthy, whether they can make it or not, from what I've seen. Yeah. And I've seen a weak fish on a beach swimming in really shallow water and a hammerhead trying to chase them in the Keys. If you ever watch, you'll never see my clients wearing gloves. I think the gloves are the most dangerous thing for tarpon. Just because they accumulate more slime, take nope. more slime off? Nope. Because the the face grab, I believe, is... Um, I'll get on my soapbox and tell you that I think I take better care of my fish than anybody I know. And I watch a lot of people, and you watch every show, fly, bait, whatever. I do not let wear gloves in people's hands. And I said, oh, if I put my hand in his jaw, he's going to hurt me. Good. Don't do it. Don't touch him. Even if you have just that lower jaw? Right Don't here. do it. No, let me ask you. What's the damage of grabbing that lower jaw? How many times have you ever seen somebody grab a lower jaw and hold on to it? I've done it. On the I've first seen. time, you grab that lower jaw and held on. Depends on how big that fish is and how green it is. The majority of the time. He's going to shake loose. Mm -hmm. Correct? Uh, I don't know. It depends. I've seen Rob Fordyce grab a whole bunch of them. He didn't let go. As you wearing gloves? Uh, a lot of times, no. I'm just... Any, anyway. I, I like Rob. And he's a big, strong dude. If anybody's going to hold on their jaw, he is. <laughs> yeah. He's... You know, he's happy. So you're saying a lot of times they, they spit out of the hands and they hit their head and gill right on the boat. One hand goes here, one hand goes here, it goes up in the gills, and they lock them together, and the fish shakes. Well, what happens if they don't do that? They say, don't go up the gill plate. You can only grab that bone right Correct. here. Correct. That's, that's the only way you're allowed to grab that fish. Is that hurting the fish? If, in my opinion, the average person can never hold on to the fish. The fish shakes and smashes his head in the boat and hurts himself. Okay, and I think that it's a bad example to set when all the shows show the face grab and the hands in the mouth because it makes everybody want to do it. And, right. And when you can hold the leader, I mean, I'd turn my phone on and show you pictures of giant fish boat side where you just hold the leader, lift it up slightly to where he turns to roll. I've built devices like Boga Grips that were super oversized ones to go on Tarpon's jaws. Mm hmm and I work with a guy in Italy, and they use them on the blue fins, and, and, and it's it's a really high-quality made tool. And um, I even had like a little lock built into it, so when the fish shakes, you could control his head next to the boat, an oversized giant boga. I begged them to build me one, and I've quit using it because the fish somehow even when it's locked into those jaws they can shake so violently whether that it comes back on the taper they can come out or it can puncture the membrane on the bottom mm -hmm. yeah and then make a hole through which can hurt their suction feeding so i built right. them with stainless steel balls on the end so where they came together it wasn't sharp like on a boga or it would disperse right i've built i've tried i've spent money i've manufactured i've trying to build a better mousetrap and um the best mousetrap is do not touch them and i can't tell you what the best thing for a guy to measure them and so you just is. you just break your fish off you don't get the hook out i have a long handled d hooker and uh you know it's got a little like pair of, you know handles you grab on and i can grab the circle hook and right. it's barbless and it, and it comes out pretty easy or i break them off um in my opinion the there's a there's something happens mentally to the fish when you manipulate them and the worst thing i've seen people do is open the jaw like a bass if you watch like that fish there from his dorsal to his tail when he's in the water when you know he's screwed is when his tail kicks about 10 degrees over and doesn't come back i don't know if it's uh a nerve something that happens but in my experiences with them when you get them both side if the guy grabs him he shakes off he shakes off he grabs a glove and he'll smash his head in the boat a few times and hurt himself and what do you do and then you 
then you, you got to hold them up and get the picture and take the hook out, right? And then you got to swim the fish and try to bring them back to health to let them go. And um, it's critical that the fish is upright and doesn't get rolled over. If I have taken the hook out, I'll grab a fish and I'll turn with my no ever gloves, turn them upside down and I'll take the hook out and I'll turn them, put them asleep. Like tonic state of mobility, mm -hmm. like you flip over a shark or gator. Uh, trout is a very good way to, so to take a hook out of yeah, a trout. I'll, I'll turn them over and when I used to touch them. And, um, and, and if you just grab the de-hooker and, and slide it down and grab it and pop the hook out uh, on a fish that's in good shape, and he's not upright. He'll turn and roll and float frequently. And uh, he's not dead. He's just asleep. And you can turn and like just hit the trolling motor thrust on him or touch him with a fishing rod. Push him with a push pull, yeah. And he'll, exactly. and he'll shoot away. Yeah. But he's kind of like zoned out. Um, you think they're sleeping at that point? When they you float, turn them they're upside asleep. Down. Yeah, yeah. And I've watched them. Sleep. I've seen them sink to the bottom. Yeah, I have too. And I've grabbed my anchor and dropped it on them because it's too deep for me to reach him any other way. Right. And it's, you know, like 12 feet of water or something. So I'll just drop my anchor like by his tail and it hit him and it'll jump up and take off. Or sometimes it'll hit the bottom in some way. Um, and when you have gloves, they breathe through their gills. It's like Velcro. You know, you got that, that very delicate gill. So you're talking there. about people with gloves that stick the hand up through the gill plate. I think that is more detrimental yeah, to yeah. them than anything and it's so commonly done I, I i agree that if you did that with your hand you come back scratched up right but when you add the the material of the glove and you rip through those gills and just scratching them you know the the btt study the one thing i was you know when i work a lot with science you're talking about a bone fish that they said that they're if they're 11 seconds out of the water as their mouths are opening and their gills are, are trying to breathe, that after being dry for 11 seconds, it would start to, the gills start to stick together. Mm. So the next time that he goes to open his mouth and they peel apart, it starts damaging the, the membrane or something because it's mm, not lubricated. And um, the fish can breathe from the surface which makes it one of the most adaptable fish in the world. But I think that- uh, You're talking about tarpon now. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and um, as again, I, I, I don't feel that I hurt my pets. I feel that I take as good of care as humanly possible of them. And I don't feel guilty at night. Um, I, I really love them. I really do. Yeah. I love catching them. But I don't let people wear gloves. I don't let people touch them. And if they don't want to do it my way, there's a lot of other boats out there. But I'm not, you know, um, going to kill them for a world record. Uh, if if they die or something, it's a sad thing. But uh, I said the one my ex caught was the only one I ever saw that just died. Um, and and we got it back swimming again. And, and the little bay it's in isn't big with not much flow. And I looked at on the shoreline on the down one side for days and I never found it. I, I, I hope it made it. Mm -hmm. What, um, you know, we've covered a pretty big spectrum here. Is there anything left you'd like to talk about? Whatever you guys want. Well, what would you, what would you like to say to everybody out there? Um, I think that uh, the average person just doesn't understand how delicate these fish are, especially in warm water. And, uh, you know, there's... Right. When you when you when you catch a lot of fish in a short period of time, you're not beating on one fish for an extended time frame. You know, I mean, I can run down and grab a leader while he's jumping and pop him off and go to the next one. And he's back in the water, going, what "The hell just happened?" Right. Um, when you watch guys in selfish tournaments, we catch fish in seconds, not minutes or hours sometimes. And uh, I think that. Whether you're a bait guy or a or a fly guy or a, or a, an offshore guy, everybody has a responsibility to be a conservationist and take good care of the animals. Would you ever consider putting a client a client on a boat when you know it's going to be a really good night, and you say, "Okay, guys, I have changed my ways. 
and I'm not going to ever hook 50 and catch 25 again? Would you ever say, guys, we're going to get, I'm going to give you three hours or 10 fish, three hours or seven fish? You know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm just I, saying I that. Th- I think, but I think what Russell's done is, he, like he said, he used to put rod hold, rods in all the rod holders and, and you know, get I, six fish up. I think what he was saying is, once they have one fish up, they'll fight that fish. You know, maybe get a double. He's limited the amount of rods you fish. Is that correct? I try to only fish four, um, <laughs> four. when I'm, <laughs> when I'm drifting. Cool. Yeah. If I'm um, in other spots where you're holding the rod, then if I have two guys, you're fishing two rods. If I'm in a, a in a drifting situation, um, because I want to cover all the water columns, I usually have you know different stuff set out on a drift. Um, so if you just fish one, then you don't know what part of the column the fisher might be one to eat in. So it would, uh, I have gotten to the point where I try to catch just enough and, um, and, and what, and how do you assess that? What is enough? I mean, like, you know, I just had surgery, but I fished, you know, yesterday and the day before and with, with my local and, uh, my sugar daddy and he, he fished two, three days a week with me. And, uh, you know, we, we were at a light and we were catching, you know, 15, 20 pounders and, and we, we plucked a couple off at a spot and, uh, and I told him, you got to pick up the trolling motor, you got to drop it, you got to do this and that tonight because I'm not, you know, I yeah, can't yeah. do anything. And, and, and we caught six and, and we went home and, uh. And he had a great time, and we didn't. I was like, "Hey, listen, I'm not getting on a plane. I'm not running. I'm not right. jiggling myself." But I mean, guys, I have a, a certain group that come from Louisiana every year, and they are just addicted. And they try to, you know, we try to try Good to numbers game with them. Oh yeah, I mean, they got the little clickers from when they duck hunt when they show up. I mean, these guys are on it. <laughs> are you ever gonna tell them to throw that, that, that so damn bad. clicker away? <laughs> I love them, man. I could I couldn't do it. Um, I charge them per bait because you know it's they like, go through a bunch of bait. Oh yeah, I wanted to ask you. Think how about many- it. Think about how when you start losing money when you're going through sixty, seventy crabs at X amount, five dollars a crab or more. And I tell them, listen, boys, you all get twenty crabs. After that, when you're clicking the tarpon bites, I'm clicking the dollar signs. So <laughs> I try to restrict them a little bit, but they're they're just the sweetest guys, and they bring a bunch of awesome food from louisiana they've been coming for a lot of years and uh and 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 they get it you know right we, we catch them quick and it's and it's changed their fishery too because they've got to come and see different things and have the shots i mean have you ever seen what they fish in louisiana for tarpon with no <laughs> it's amazing spear guns they use i know they have this they use 300 <laughs> pound joke. liter not bullshitting you. 300 pound liter. 300 pound liter on a 16 0 circle hook that's it's blue marlin worthy. And they troll a jig head with a with a with a paddle tail behind it. And um How big are these fish? They they catch pretty big ones here. And actually Jeff, one of the the guys, is one of the ones that, that gaffed that big one that made all that big uh stink years ago for the tournament when they caught the state record. Yeah, how big was that? Uh, I don't know, it was 240 or something. Right. And um, I think that's how they found me was that I think I commented. I was like, oh, that's a good one, you know. And then he started looking through my Facebook, and and he was seeing bigger fish than they were catching in Louisiana and, and, and some of my pictures. And they came over and they fished with me. And then they come twice a year, once to Miami in the winter and once to the Honda and, and you know, wherever they want to go to. But they have a house in Alamrata that they – have a buddy with and you know they try their goal is to to jump a hundred and the three or four day trip they usually fish two trips a day with me and we usually catch you know usually catch 50 or so and get 80 or 100 bites but right those are the guys that were there during the 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 corona times and get the big numbers is this uh sustainable I think that it isn't. I, I think the fish is collapsing, 
in my opinion. I think everything that we know and have seen is falling apart before our eyes. And on many levels. But uh, the tarpon fishery, in my opinion, is collapsing. And it makes me really sad to say it. Mostly because of the habitat. Water. All because of water quality. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't think that... I mean, according to the scientists, they have the Caribbean body of fish that comes up. They'll come off of Cuba and everywhere else and swim across to the Keys. They got the Mexico guys that come up and it was like the party hub. And um, I think it's important in their reproduction but they you know they don't need a worm to reproduce when you go to costa rica and look at the tarpon fishery out there offshore in the atlantic side i mean it's the biggest schools of tarpon i've ever seen in the ocean swimming out there in 120 feet of water on frigate birds and you're like we're gonna catch a sailfish here and you roll in there and you're just like holy shit this exists and usually it's too rough to get out of the pass at a river or something but when you can go see it it's impressive. I, I think that the fish are just going to change their travel plans when there isn't enough food to sustain them. And I think that the reason that we have less fish every year is because like a pond can only grow a fish to a certain size because of its dynamics. And the, there's only going to be a certain amount of fish because there's only a certain amount of food. Right. And... Um. I think that they're just going to go somewhere else. I don't think they're dying. I don't. I, I don't think. No, that, I don't think so either. I think that they're going to go further out into the Gulf. They're going to go more towards Honduras and Mexico and Belize and other places that that have better food. And you look at Louisiana; they're doing the pogey netting now within a mile of the beach, and they'll net so many tons of pogey. And if they lift the net up and the pogies are too small, they don't have enough fat and oil in them. And they'll dump the nets and just just thousands of dead fish floating everywhere and dead redfish and everything else and trout in them because that wasn't a profitable net netting because mm -hmm. the the bait was too small it didn't have the fat content that they want and and um, they're trying to to work on that netting and this year in Louisiana my clients were just there bottom fishing. And the rigs that we fished last year that we crushed the red snappers at, he told me he couldn't get a snapper past the sharks. Said it was ridiculous. Right. And a few months ago, there was a school of tarpon in Louisiana that my were at, and they drifted. And he said, Russ, it was crazy. Said we fished for five hours on one drift and never got out of them rolling. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of fish in this big bay. And I was like, God, I wish I could go, you know, see that school. But I think that, uh, you know, if, if your grocery store closes, they just, you know, where you go down the street to another one. And right. Well, there's the, uh, there's the food impetus, and water there's the impetus to, you know, support all these great conservation groups that are fighting, you know, for clean water. I mean, this year we just had red tide or a fish kill or whatever you want to call it in Miami. Like when I was in the hospital, like a week ago, I was watching and I was like, oh crap. And last year we had a, a fish kill in the Bay in Biscayne Bay. And um, those are the fish, you know, in the last maybe three or four years are the first times in my life I ever can recall seeing that. Maybe when I was young it happened, I don't know. I know the West Coast has always, you always heard about it over there. It's the first time I've ever seen it here. Yeah, and I was panicking when I was like, "God, like all these baby dead fish floating around, and you know, and the spots where we go catch pilchards or pinfish or bait, all the grass is dead and it's mud in Biscayne Bay." And and I was like, "Man, there's there's not going to be any shrimp this year." And the and it was a mild winter, so the fish didn't show up early. And I was like, you know, really concerned. And it was the most shrimp I ever seen in my damn life. They were shrimp runs last year that blew my mind. And I was like, how does it make sense? I mean, when you have this kind of habitat destruction, where did they come from? Right. I mean, there's shrimp running in places that have brackish water that I've never seen a shrimp in my entire life. And for three days, there was shrimp frothing on the surface. I'm like, I, I did, I mean, did an airplane drop them off in here? Like, where the <laughs> hell did they come from? And, 
I'm just a fisherman. I'm not a scientist. I only know what I see every day in the interactions on the water. And when the spots that we catch the bait, the bait's not there because the grass is dead. When you go by the golf course and I watched a guy rip open a 50 pound bag of something and pour it in the pond that connects to the bay because they don't want to see weeds in there. And I'm right, assuming man. he's dumping this 50 pound bag and I watch because there's one place on Miami beaches, you know, we'd sneak in there off the side of the road and catch the little, the little micro tarpons in the pond sometime on little crappie jigs as kids. And you watch a guy in the morning when the place is open and we're out there in the dark with a headlight and it's sunrise and we're catching little peanuts. And here comes the guy with a golf cart and he's checking everything and he opens like every day and rips the bag open and just dumps these giant bags into the, the little ponds on the course. And there's a pipe going right right to the bay. And, um, you know, a lot of stuff isn't on on, on uh, sewer pipes yet. Like in the Keys, everything was on septic, and now it's all going to the sewer pipes. And they say that they could put chemicals in the ground and and watch in an hour. It was I soaking out. I think Rick out, Ruoff said that a long time ago when he was testing some stuff. Soaking mm, out but, through the coral and the reef. and. Uh, well, yeah. look, all we can do is just keep fighting. Yeah. And vo and you know, voicing, you know, what we see and what we hear and what we experience. I, I think just... that we need a, a a a more unified front to We're starting to get that with Captains for Clean Water. There's a lot of people that are up there in Tallahassee. And I agree. But when there's there's too much divide between a fly guy and a bait guy crying over a spot or whether a cut bait on the bottom should be illegal and everybody wants to change us and this spot's illegal. And I think that but we need to but unify. They but they do ban when it comes to habitat and clean water. I think that's where we all need to get together and put our, our power and our money and our voices. But I think water. that is the main fight. That yeah. is the main fight, and that is, and then everything else is just that is priority. I mean, look, I mean, look, I mean, look DeSantis killed the the bill. You know, it was because a lot of guys went up there and knocked on Tallahassee's door and said this is wrong, and just exposed it. And, and we I have thank to just everybody to that, that went up there to those meetings that I couldn't make because I've been to other ones here, but I I couldn't go up for that. Yeah. yeah, I think that is the main fight in the for sure, and I think we're all together on that. But uh, we spoke about all. You know, it's mostly tarpon and sharks, but I know you've had a bigger life offshore in St. Thomas and Bahamas, and, yeah. and you're innovative in the offshore world as well, not only with tarpon, but uh, we're going on two hours here, and yeah, we're I know you have a lot- Probably you know, boring. No, you're not boring at all. I know you have a bigger story, but maybe we'll have you on again, but um, thank, thank you so, so much. much for coming. I love coming to see you guys. Absolutely. And I, and I love breakfast at the pig or something. Next even time. though I'm a fly guy, <laughs> you and I have been good pals for a long oh, time. It's, it's I'm I a think, bait guy too. I think it's a unified front that we all have to fight to protect our, our resources. And I yeah. think that everybody's intention is good to what they're trying to do. But I think that uh, it should be good science that's used and not bad science. And I don't think that um, limiting the shark population should be off the table when it's the biggest issue versus limiting the humans. I agree. They're, they're rampant. Well, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. When I saw it's West Side Story, when I saw it's just a ride.